Hello, and welcome to the Smart Contract Research Forum's panel on privacy and SNARKs. And we have uh, some great guests today to uh, to dig into the topic. Uh, I'm Eugene Leventhal. I'm the operations lead here at SCURF. And I'm just going to quickly hand it off to Lucas Nuzzi, who is our research lead, to uh, moderate and lead this discussion. So yeah, please take it away, Lucas. Thank you, Eugene, and welcome, everyone to uh, what's gonna be a really fun discussion on uh, the state of the industry when it comes to uh, ZK rollups and the low level protocols that uh, enable them. And to have this conversation, we have two of what I consider the top researchers in the space uh, doing work in this area. Uh, Ariel Gabizon, who um, has been doing research in this area for, for quite some time, now at Aztec Protocol, is building a, a really interesting ZK roll-up solution, as well as Alex Vlazov, uh, who has also been researching this area for quite some time uh, and has been working with uh, ZK Sync uh, in their various approaches to uh, roll-ups. Gentlemen, welcome to the panel. Really a pleasure to have you on board. Uh, maybe to kick things off, uh, you guys can give a little bit of an introdu introduction of yourselves and your projects. And uh, we do have some questions to, to, to go over, but it would be great to hear from you guys, uh, the evolution of your research, what you've been working on in the areas that you focus on. Maybe starting with you, Ariel. Uh, yeah, sure. So, uh... I guess, yeah, I, uh, I basically, I, I spent a lot of years in academia doing math, computers, and computer science. And uh, once basically I read the Bitcoin white paper, I was, I felt that I should sort of get into this world. And the best way for me to do it seemed to be through these uh, ZK uh, zero knowledge proofs, um, since they were relatively math heavy with the sort of math I liked and was comfortable with. Uh, so that led to me working with uh, Eli Ben Sasson back in, in Technion University in Israel uh, in the early days of Starks before they were called Starks. Uh, and then I sort of left academia to work uh, on, on Zcash, uh, the first uh, trusted setups, uh, you know, the first, the first sort of commercial use of Snarks was, was there and that was really exciting. And uh, yeah, and then a sort of a chance meeting with uh, Zach Williamson uh, led to this, uh, this universal ZK SNAR called Plonk, which uh, sort of, I think, really put universal SNARKs in, in sort of in the practical, uh, made them very, very practical. And uh, yeah, and then I, that led to me moving from uh, Protocol Labs, where I was uh, working, to, uh, to Aztec. Uh, to, to focus on, on this work with, with Zach and the, the Aztec team. Excellent. How about you, Alex? Uh, well, regarding the way into SNARKs themselves, um, I was participating in ETH Waterloo, I think it was actually the first one from ETH Global Series, which continued for a few years after. And at this hackathon, there was the talk well, first by, I think, by Vitalik on Snarks, and then by Ailey Ben Sasson on Starks. So this is when it first caught my attention in general for what's possible to do with, uh, with the Snarks at, at that point in time. Uh, then I was working on plasmas in different flavors. And then at some point, we decided to form a meta labs to bring the, both, uh, the best from two worlds and uh, kind of marry the roll-ups. Um, and ZK Snarks to make the, the ZK Sync, the ZK Rollup released a few years ago. Um, so now we are continuing to develop it uh, to bring in uh, the version 2.0. Um, and it should be able to run user defined smart contracts, which should be compilable from Solidity and Sync, which is our, like, our de uh, developed uh, programming language. Um, also not specifically for circuits, just normal programming. In theory, we should be able to even build Rust and run it uh, in our architecture, but uh, it's a little bit off topic. Uh, so yeah, along the way, uh, I participated in uh, like 
in improving snarks as for us it's more like a tool uh, than something like um, pristine and fundamental. So for this purpose, we uh, developed like we published a small paper about the transparent polynomial commitments which used Fry, and then which led into the expanded paper called the Redshift. So this was roughly my way into here. Now we're in the final stages to bring the kissing 2.0 with smart contracts to life with basically all snark related work done. Now we just have to check the code, run the tests and be able to release it so people can try a, a compiler, see how the VM was designed. Actually, we have to write a lot of manuals, uh, but it should, it's on a good track. Yeah, it was super interesting background. And I think it, it, it ties things very nicely. I do remember when Vitalik first described uh, what we now call ZK rollups, <clears throat> you know, essentially applying this technology, which the industry had predominantly seen as an approach to privacy with projects like Zcash uh, applied to scalability, right? Uh, enabling transactions to be processed. Uh, outside of 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 the blockchain, uh, and essentially borrowing some ideas, even from Plasma, at a time when more research was coming out on the feasibility of Plasma, that uh, I would say disappointed a lot of people. So to set the stage a little bit, uh, it would be interesting to talk about uh, the commonality and and the theme of the projects that you guys are working on, because when people think about uh, zk snark state still have this anchor towards privacy, right? Whereas uh, because of a, a lot, because of the research that you guys have, have produced over the years, that theme has shifted quite a bit, right? Uh, from privacy to scalability. And now with uh, recursive snarks, with the ability to program uh, contracts uh, using these systems and still carrying some of the benefits that uh, SNARKs intrinsically have. So maybe to set the stage a little bit, uh, Ariel, could you just talk about uh, recursive SNARKs and, and, and Plonk and what is it that enables these contracts to be uh, generalized uh, and, and really just granting the tools to the developers to build these contracts using this technology? Um. Well, uh, so I, I maybe one thing to mention is like why are uh, recursive snarks uh, relevant to or essential to programmability? Uh, and I guess one part of that is if eventually you have one sort of verification contract that is constant, uh, like say this is the contract that verifies the rollup. Uh, so this contract is fixed. It's not dependent on a specific program. So in this sense, recurs recursion helps you because whatever your sort of actual circuit is, the, the final thing, the final program you're, you're, you're running is, is just a, uh, a verifier. Um, uh, another, so, uh, sort of what, what is the relation between Plonk and, and, uh, and recursion? Uh, so the first thing to notice is that in principle, there's any ZK snark gives you recursion because ZK snarks allow you to prove statements about any program. So you can always prove them prove a statement about the SNARK verification program in particular. Uh, so recursion was, was never impossible uh, theoretically. It was really a question of constants. And the concrete constants when, when writing your uh, program, your SNARK verification program uh, due to basically field mass mismatches uh, we're, we're just we're just very large. Uh, so one reason why sort of Plonk made recursion more simpler is basically shaving off a few constant factors uh, when in terms of representing constraints compared to 
the R1CS representation. Uh, that, and these sort of factors shaved off exactly sort of made this, this uh, writing the recursive verification program more, uh, more practical without the need for any special tricks like elliptic curve cycles. Um, yeah, so I'm, <laughs> I'm saying a lot of things there that uh, maybe need explaining, but that's sort of the mid to high level. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. And I think there's a uh, part of the priming that uh, I see exists when people reason about ZK rollups. I think it's exactly that, right? I think there's, there's a lot of priming in terms of applicability. I think there's this idea that um, uh, a ZK snark is application specific, right? It's, its role is to simply verify transactions. And the reason why I think there's been a lot of this priming is that in order for you to, under previous systems, uh, bootstrap an application, it requires creating this uh, string through a process um, that uh, must generate an, a, a random number, right? A, a random string. And what your research has shown over the years is that uh, this is abstracted away uh, through, uh, you know, shaving uh, s some of those some of those parameters, so that you can apply this technology to broader programs without the requirements of actually regenerating these strings, um, which uh, in increase kind of the potential attack vectors of, of these systems, right? So it, it really just enabled a way for you to um, reuse that SRS uh, for a plethora of app applications that can then be granted the benefits of, of, of this technology. Is this, is this a correct characterization? Oh, well, that is, I mean, so th that is another huge issue. Uh, yeah, that uh, uh, universal snarks like Plonk uh, don't require a setup per circuit uh yeah that um i i was referring to this i guess other more low level uh issue that uh to actually write the snark verifier as a program you need to sort of simulate these these field operations in a non-native field and that was extremely an inefficient before plunk uh, but actually, maybe you're right that for, yeah, actually, you're right that a much more basic issue, if, if you want uh, recursion and user-defined circuits, uh, yeah, so the universality is actually a much larger and more basic point. Yeah, uh, otherwise, you would need, uh, every user would need to run its, his own, their own trusted setup. Yeah, and, and I think there's been a lot of really interesting uh, content. I think even the the initial powers of Tao ceremony uh, from Zcash that you you uh, were one of the uh, architects of, uh, I, I think there's a lot of mysticism around what that actually entails, right, and 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 how that is performed. But the basic idea is that 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 string must be uh, secure enough. Uh, or, or random enough so that uh, you have guarantees around the provers and verifiers of, of, of these systems. Um, Alex, you've worked on um, this scheme called Redshift, right? Which was a really interesting uh, piece of research. And um, it basically introduced an interactive Oracle proof system that use polynomial commitments to essentially circumvent the need for uh, a trusted SRS. Could you talk a little bit about Redshift? Uh, what motivated that research? Was it the security uh, and, and more universal angle um, that uh, motivated that research? And, and also, if you could also talk about the evolution of that research uh, and what, you know, led 
you guys into Planck um, uh, as you were uh, as that research evolved and uh, maybe the trade offs associated with uh, with that research. Uh, well, first of all, I should mention that um, so there was like for Redshift and its history, there was no particular like decision to do such research. Uh, the historical state at this time was that there was a, a deep fry paper by Elie Ben Sasson and his colleagues, which basically uh, used uh, FRI, proximity testing protocol, um, in some particular way, which allows them to have more uh, efficient Stark. Uh, and here by Stark, I mean a proof system and the way of, of arithmetization, which is called AIR in the original paper. Um, and basically what this paper um, was doing is very close to what uh, the Planck paper in it was doing in its original form with just the polynomial commitments, uh, which are Katek commitments. Basically the prover commits to the set of polynomials and then draws a random point, then make a standard trick of quashing, basically uh, if your polynomial is at this value at this point, then you can perform a division, formal division operation, and that the result will also be a polynomial. Uh, and then they use the fry to prove that this result of the division is indeed very close to polynomial, which was sufficient for all the purposes of Stark as a proof system. Uh, but it was never called a polynomial commitment, even while it was doing basically the same as the commitment itself. Uh, just in a different way. Uh, I read this paper and then after half a year or something like this, there was a Plunk paper, which I seen like was covering largely the same details uh, in the same format. And only then I just randomly in a train actually had an idea, well, this is basically the same and what, no, why no one tried to do it. And then we spent two weeks trying to convince ourselves that there was no some trivial mistake and overlook that this is very, very much the same idea, which, which was never covered. Uh, so then we made a very small um, a paper on archive, which was basically tell, uh, talking about the polynomial commitments, uh, which was strict commitments to only a single polynomial and used PRI as a proximity testing protocol in a mode which is called unique decoding radius. Uh, a little bit simpler, it was testing that something which Prover gave you is close to the polynomial, uh, it's like very close to polynomial. Let's, let's call it this way for simplicity for now. Um, and then we started to, which led to larger proof sizes, which was original, which was a problem with the original Starks back then when they were introduced. They required very small radius for testing of proximity, which led to larger proofs. Uh, and then we decided to go beyond this uh, the same kind of the same achievement which was done in the deep fry paper to go beyond unique decoding radius and this was done in the redshift paper and the main trick or like slash problem with going beyond decoding radius was that now the prover is able to commit not just to a single polynomial but some set of polynomials the set is still small compared to the field size so um it wasn't the end of the day for most of the, for, for soundness, uh, but it would be okay for witness polynomials. So the prover can give you something which is like maybe one polynomial out of 10, which satisfies the verification relationship. Was still fine for uh, witness polynomials, but it would be a problem for setup polynomials which were present in all the proof systems other than Starks and others which are like, Uni for uniform circuits. Uh, let's not go that deep into this direction. Uh, so we had to find a way how to actually pinpoint a single polynomial out of the set at the setup time, which was done in Bradshaw, which basically brought the best from the Starks uh, world uh, and basically transferred it to all the protocols which require polynomial commitments. Uh, that's why it was a, like that's why it was demonstrated on Planck itself, because uh, it was uh, first uh, an original inspiration, and then the idea was uh, like that you can do the same, you can run the same proofs uh, by just 
swapping the commitment scheme and maybe adding some factors in the soundness. So that's why the redshift was made in a, in a form which basically taken the plonk uh, and kind of changed it a little bit. Uh, so actually, uh, go ahead, Eru. Yeah. So actually, uh, Alex, I'm. What do you think really about the uh, non sort of non pre-processing Starks versus, uh, yeah, doing like like Redshift? Uh, do Do you think it's like what if you had to choose between these two? Uh, what would you What would you uh, choose? Um, uh, well. I don't like. I have a preference for one with the preprocessing for reasons that it can be uh, much simpler to write and design by people who cannot like just take the polynomials and write the polynomial protocol by hand on a piece of paper by basically linking all the witness values by themselves uh, in a very large set of witness polynomials. So the problem with the protocols which are like Starks without preprocessing is that your set of constraints is so much non-trivial that first of all, it's difficult to design without mistakes. And the second, after you design it, it's unlikely that you will find another person who would be able to review it. Uh, so, but if, you, if your proof system is more like more universal in a sense that uh, the preprocessing written once does everything for you. And when you design the circuit, you only write uh, a code which is much simpler. So you do not manually take care of which variable is located in what polynomial at which index. And you basically treat them like polynomial like values uh, and variables in any, like in some convoluted programming language, it eliminates a lot of mistakes um, and it actually becomes auditable and understandable by the wider audience. That's why I think that there are more people which are able to write a long circuit uh, or maybe understand the, um, like to understand Sprout uh, or Sapling Zcash, Zcash circuits than people who would be able to run, uh, to write a Stark to, for example, do the, uh, the Peterson commitment. And Peterson commitment is actually quite trivial. For whatever people uh, in uh, Starkware did for the Cairo programming language, uh, I can guess how it works. I didn't look in details and didn't try to reverse it, but I can guess how it works. Um, but I think it would be non-trivial for anyone to try to, uh, to uh, like to try to write an external uh, manual to how it's actually implemented. Even so, you will see a full set of constraints in the verifier if it's implemented as a solidity contract. Fascinating. Yeah, it's it's uh it's interesting to hear about the reasoning behind some of these trade offs, right? I think if uh, if the the research around um, even more recently with Planck and, and its its newer iterations uh, and all of its predecessors uh, showcases is that there are some non-trivial trade-offs at play, right? Uh, when it comes to usability, proving time, verification time, proof sizes, uh, even complexity. What other trade-offs, you know, fueled your research as you're thinking about, um, for example, shifting the, the commitment scheme um, you know, in this, in this circumstance for, for efficiency purposes. Um, what are the trade-offs that influence your, your research, especially as you're trying to build the system for uh, Ethereum applications? Uh, well, I think one should actually separate uh, two parts here. One is designing the final system in the sense that it's like what circuits you write, which is the functions of the circuits, where whether those circuits require to have require uh, some recursive verification because they kind of prove different substatements of one larger logical statement, and so they require recursive verification. And another trade-off trade -off is purely regarding the proof systems and like concrete implementations of the recursive approach. 
For example, if you take the fractal paper, uh, it was a direct compar comparison was done there. So the fractal paper is also transparent snark or, or stark, like how, however you want with the pre-processing. Um, and what they did is they presented the size of the circuit which, circuit which does the verification, a recursive verification of single statement. Uh, if you use one hash or another hash to construct the Merkle trees when you do the proofs. So if you use a standard non-algebraic hash, then your statement, then your verification circuit is very large because non-algebraic hashes take a lot of constraints to implement, which was partially solved by the, by the Plonk with lookup tables. But we can cover it a little bit later. And another example they did, and they used the rescue hash as a hash to construct the Merkle trees, which led to much smaller circuits to implement the verifier but which also led to the much larger proving time because the hash itself was very slow to compute. So this would be, I would say, I think more to the question which you asked originally in the sense of different trade-offs. Uh, in a similar direction, you can view how many constraints does one recursive aggregation in Plonk take. And it also depends a lot. For example, if your verification keys are all the same, it's one number. If your verification keys, keys are all different, it's completely different number. Like I think find five times larger. Uh, if you if I remember correctly, like roughly at least. And this even would not be a complete verification. It would be aggregation, which is also a little bit different procedure. And I really can cover it in details. I think uh, much better than I do. So like for this, we should separate this talk and first maybe talk about the proof systems and trade-offs coming from proof systems themselves. And then you can try to talk about how you can actually try to implement a programmability uh, kind of separately, and which is unlikely to depend on how you, in, on what proof system you take if you have the recursion. It's another like field of optimizations, I would say. Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting framing, um, I think. That's exactly right, right? You you start with the proof system, uh, and then recursion is is is, is applied, and then you have all the interesting benefits of it. But Ariel, were you were you going to say something? Um, yeah. Well, what was I going to say? Uh, I guess. Do you agree with this framing? Um, is this is this the, the the correct way to reason about the the trade offs of, of, of these systems? Um, what, well, what what is that that way again? Uh, it was more about that you can separate this large equation made by Lucas um, into one is like what are trade offs in proof systems and their particular implementations versus. Uh, a design area of how you actually implement programmability. And from my perspective, those are like completely two different tasks. One is optimize how you implement proof systems and recursion, like particular hash function choices, uh, commitment schemes choices, maybe something else we can talk about this. And another one is how you actually make, make a circuit, which for example, does the CK rollup and maybe uh, verifies user defined uh, circuits and contracts. So I would say like two completely different deals for me at least. Uh, yeah. Um, well, you know, what, one thing uh, just uh, I think about you, uh, Lucas, uh, originally you, uh, in terms of trade-offs of po po polynomial commitment schemes, I, I think right now the the KZG, the Kate, the, the, the Verucha Goldberg one is, uh, is clearly like, uh, you know the 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 winner, uh, right? The 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 only, I think the only reason to use an, anything else is if sort of pairing friendly curves will will at some point be be crushed and uh, uh, yeah and uh, and then there there'll be no choice but but to use uh, to use something else. Uh, yeah, I don't. know. I think yeah. There's there's there were a lot of parts of of this uh, of of this question. Uh, maybe yeah, maybe <laughs> maybe let's go to the next question. I, there's a lot of parts, so I I'm not sure what to. It's it's a loaded question. Exactly. For, yeah. for, 
but but you did mention something interesting with regards to pairing based cryptography that we've we we've had a couple of discussions in in the past um and you of course you know a huge topic of your research is is, is security you know ethereum uses a variant of bn 256 uh, in uh, as 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 a proving curve or as a curve in 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 at the base layer uh, eth2 moving to bls 12 3 1 um, what is your take on the security of these curves and and, and maybe um, of pairing based cryptography more more generally do you think there will be a scenario in the short term and here's another loaded question where these curves need to change or setups need to change uh yeah i don't know it's like asking will bitcoin hit uh uh one million dollars or let's say will bitcoin hit one hundred thousand dollars within three months two years five years never uh is it a matter of really- when not if <laughs> well there is there is a question of if uh it's really it's really it's really hard to say you've got these these number field save attacks that uh that are what makes us go to go to larger curves and it's it's really tricky to it's really tricky to say you know you occasionally have a new paper with some improvement and then it's sort of like how fast are these improvements going to go are they going to get stuck are they going to um yeah so it's it's really it's really hard to say i mean i i tried to to understand practically how uh how safe is bn254 for for the next few years um Yeah, honestly, it's 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 really hard to say. It's really hard to to say if like okay, the current attacks need you know a little extra trick to 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 make it dangerous to use BN two five four, or there's going to be like you know ten years till till this trick comes. Or uh, it's 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 really it's really hard to it's really hard to say. One one annoying thing is that you've got like when you've got like uh, like the Pollard's row algorithm. So the proof runtime is very well uh, analyzed, but with these number field sieve attacks, they're saying, okay, this is the, the runtime under these uh, number, number of sort of theoretic conjectures. And, and then you're sort of like, okay, so should I, should I update my code according to the more pessimistic, like pessimistic in terms of like not say the, user, not the attacker. Should I update my curve according to the more pessimistic estimate sort of versions of these conjectures or should I actually wait till there's a, right? Because, uh, so these curves have like 200, 254 bits that we're using right now in Ethereum. So if you, if you look at Zcash, for example, they write one, the minute there was a paper saying, okay, there is potentially an attack on this curve, immediately they move. So, you know, what should be your, and, and what should be your approach? The minute like some, you know, uh, someone writes a paper where this maybe is not safe anymore, do you move then? Or do you say, well, you know, show me an at- actual attack on, you know, like you say, okay, SHA-256 is not safe anymore. It has what, 80 rounds. Or show me at least an attack of the, you know, break 70 of the 80 rounds. So, Equivalently, all right. Show me an actual discrete log computation in a in a field that is, you know, getting close to, to what we're using, and then I'll I'll switch my curve. Or do you, it seems, you know, that the more what people are actually doing is the minute there's a paper saying, okay, this may be dangerous, they immediately move. They don't they don't uh, want more evidence. So so honestly, I yeah, this is sorry, it's a bit of a rant. When Zcash, when we when we moved so quickly, I was like, oh, you know, we're, we're sort of giving them too much, cre- you know, credit, like legitimizing it too much. Leg- yeah. yeah. But, uh, but on the other hand, when I, when I talked to uh, some of these experts in, in the last few months, uh, yeah, I don't know. It seems like they have a lot of tricks up their sleeves and so it's, yeah, this is sort of a long way of saying, uh, 
uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, re- I don't really know. I mean, it's a, it really is like the price of you know Bitcoin. Like, uh, <laughs> how long will it take to to hit the next like the the one hundred k? You know, is it going to be tomorrow? You know, soon? Is it going to be never? Is it going to be really slowly? No one knows. Yeah, it, it's 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 an interesting area of research, and I, I think it, it it's exactly what you said, right? It it it's really a matter of making these design decisions uh, on a proactive or reactive basis on the basis of, you know, how legitimate um, or how concerned from a practical perspective, um, you know, so, some of these attacks are, you know, Klaus Schnorr recently said that he broke RSA and, and, you know, our, is, is the industry completely moving away from, from RSA? It's, it's uh, it's not really happening. So it, it it's fits into that th- those trade offs. But is this something that, uh, as you're designing these systems uh, that you guys take into consideration, uh, do do you have kind of contingency plans, uh, if if this were to happen, um, how proactive is that design? Because I would imagine it would it would be a non trivial shift, right? If uh, bear and base curves were were to be uh, as you mentioned, at, at seventy rounds, uh, be proven um, susceptible to some of these attacks. Or is that well, not part of 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 well, the of the, those those research the, the decisions or, or design decisions? Well, I think the nice thing is is yeah, since po- sort of the polynomial commitment scheme is an independent component. It shouldn't. It shouldn't be too tricky to move to a system that doesn't um, rely on pairing-based curves. Um, yeah, um, you'll you'll take the efficiency hit, but but it shouldn't be too tricky. Do Do you have a a favorite alternative to BN two five six? That's a maybe uh, ETH2 researchers should, should consider or, or even the client developers should, should be looking out for? Oh, uh, I mean, just from, from the top of my head, I, 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 would, I would maybe switch to these, uh, these discrete logarithm-based systems. So something similar to, to what Zcash is doing with Halo. Yeah, which is another really interesting move um and you know uses it, it, it's interesting to think about the modularity of these systems and uh how research kind of ends up intersecting i know there, there's quite a bit of uh of, of, of inspiration from blanc that's 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 being used uh, within within halo which is super interesting um but in the topic of of tooling and and you know, it's interesting to think about these systems um, interacting with base layers like Ethereum, like other networks. Um, of course, we're talking about the uh, decisions that are made at the client level that impacts the design of, of, of roll-up solutions. Um, what is your take on the states of tooling around um, around these systems, uh, especially as it relates to building and, 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 and iterating upon efficiency. You know, there's been quite a bit of conversations recently about the Poseidon hash function uh, that's specialized for efficiency in the uh, zero knowledge uh, system paradigm. Is this something that you guys are um, looking into? Uh, is, this, is this something that uh, you guys um, plan on integrating Curious to, to, to hear think about this and and tooling more 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 broadly um, for for the systems that you're building. Uh, well, I can try to kind of answer this question in the previous one in a little bit opposite direction. So for us and we like for various reasons we want to switch away from BM two five four. For example, like because we build the a roll-up which should be able to uh, to run the solidity-based smart contracts, and we get to the part when the primitive type, like the people would which would use, is 256-bit unsigned integer. 
which doesn't fit into the base field of both PN256 and BLS12381. And it's not even clear if BLS12381 will go into the Ethereum 1. whatever uh, in the nearby time. So for this reason, um, we really want to switch to another proof system. Not Well, not the proof system, but by proof system, I would say it's, it's, it's still going to be Plunk in the sense of how the authentication is performed, the setup is, and preprocessing is performed, it's just the commitment scheme will change. And for the Redshift style commitment scheme, we see quite a lot of actually good sides in there. So when, we, it, was, when it was originally introduced, um, we had like, we obviously would have the same problem as Fractal. If you use a fast hash function to make a proof, then your circuit size is going to be large to make a verifier. And then we got the Plunk with lookup tables, which shaved a constant on the implementation of all non-algebraic hashes, uh, which made a verifier actually kind of feasible. Well, not feasible, just quite small uh, in, in there. Uh, and then we actually got the Halo, Halo Infinite paper which uh, touched the fry uh, based polynomial commitment schemes very little, but which gave us inspirations of which uh, inspirations that we actually overlooked a single a one trick. So we instead of making a full verifier, we can indeed go into the aggregation direction. And the same way we can, uh, as a, in Halo Infinite, uh, we can perform aggregation and delay the final verification of proximity to the very last uh, proof verification, which shaved a factor of logarithm from the complexity of the verifier circuit because we don't like, uh, we need to do logarithmically smaller number of hashes at the end of the day. Uh, logarithmically by the size of the circuit, which we want to recursively verify. Uh, and now uh, from what I see, I would expect in the near what time, uh, some new algebraic hashes which should be much faster to compute, even compared to the Poseidon, which is the fastest one of which I know and which I secure. But it's still not at the level of performance, for example, Blake and Shadow Factor And this will allow us to make a verifier even smaller, so nothing will stop us from going to uh, transparent proof systems uh, and getting kind of all the benefits. A field which we can choose freely, which will fit 256 bit unsigned integer in a single element. And in addition, we can make a field in a such a way that our uh, multiplication will be uh, quite faster than uh, uh, over arbitrary prior field, just because of the structure of the field modules. We can do a lot of other, uh, like combining all these tricks is a huge benefit. And this would basically benefit the final circuits which implements the virtual machine and the rollup itself. So for us, it's actually a positive direction in the sense. And really, you would want to switch for a lot of reasons. And the only thing which would require on a Ethereum base level is basically the EVM384 set of opcodes, which is still, still not strictly required, but would be convenient. So these 384, uh, this 384 thing, it does have uh, 256 uint in a single uh, field element? Uh, well, I mean, we can choose a field a little bit smaller than th 320 bits, basically five 64-bit limbs, uh, to be able to utilize things like the lowest four limbs are going to be 0, 0, 0, and 1, a standard trick for faster multi Montgomery multiplication. Uh, then we can also do a lot of partial Montgomery reductions, which are very, <laughs> actually <laughs> very convenient for modern processors without branching and other stuff. Um, so with all this, what we will need at the end of the day is basically perform some field operations in Ethereum smart contract when we will do the verification, like the one final verification in Ethereum. And it's only there when we will need to uh, have Ethereum being able to make modular uh, operations. And still, we can do it with existing primitives, but we will just pay more. This might be an interesting 
segue into um, this level of compatibility with Ethereum, Ethereum programs. Uh, I, th- I think one discussion that is, well, there, there are two main discussions that are that are happening right now in terms of uh, of ZK rollups that excite people. I think one uh, relates to this idea where uh, you can scale a lot of these applications uh, as you're processing it in uh, a rollup layer, uh, and still being able to use the the tooling, the the, the compilers, the IDEs that exist for a language like uh, Solidity, um, and then also in in the context of of, of of privacy, potentially having a pathway to having these programs being private. Uh, I think it would be really interesting for the audience to to get an overview of um, how that is achieved respectively in in your projects, which um, differs quite a bit, um, but I'd be interested in hearing from you guys. Um, Maybe starting with with you, um, Alex. Given your work on zk EVM, what is zk EVM? Um, what level of privacy should users expect from zk EVM? Um, how did you guys go about designing it, and um, what are the, the interesting things that you've learned along the way? And then we can uh, switch to you, Ariel, um, and talk about the bridges that you guys are building on. Um, on Aztec? Uh, well, first of all, I should note that uh, ZK EVM is, has become for some reason a very popular term and is abused because it, the meaning of this is not defined. So just to make things concrete, the way the things we, which we designed even while it was called the ZK EVM uh, by us, like as, as the first who named it, uh, is that we design a virtual machine, like a rollup, which obviously should incorporate some form of virtual machine to be able to run user-defined smart contracts. And the, and that we want to run 99.9% of solidity, solidity contracts uh, in a sense that we should be able to compile them. Uh, compile them. Uh, it's not exactly the same as trying to claim that you would want to write an EVM byte code and semantic compatible uh, snar- uh, virtual machine is implemented as a circuit, which is completely different deal, which I would personally consider uh, over the roof complexity for various reasons and all the experience which we gained when we designed our virtual machine. So that's why for, I would say, let's not use the KEVM uh, in, in a conversation because it will be very misleading. So, but for us, it, aim is basically take the user solidity code, compile it into the set of operations which is supported by our our virtual machine and which end user may not even care as most people don't care what is the the Ethereum bytecode is and what are particular operations in there as long as their solidity code compiles. And then you basically get all the same functionality with quite a few extensions. Uh, so this is our goal. Uh, so, and then, yeah, it's obviously should be zero knowledge friendly. So when it's expressed and as a circuit, which proves the execution of user defined program, and this approach is not even new. It was in a regional tiny round paper from 2013, which allowed you to execute basically arbitrary user defined program by simulating the processor. Uh, Yes, you can do the same. Now is you can just do it a little bit more efficient by shaving a lot of constants from the concrete proof complexity. But it's also still not a new approach. Um, so yeah, and the recursion definitely helps us because we can now um, use the approach of divide and conquer. So for whatever logical statement we have, if this logical statement is highly homogeneous, uh, highly heterogeneous, so it has some sub-statements which are quite local and can be proven separately, we can efficiently prove those statements separately and then perform perform a recursive verification, which will also guarantee us that the full statement uh, is also true. So the same approach, uh, well, this is, I would say, is the only possible approach to make something which looks like an Ethereum, but implemented as a, uh, a ZK rollup. 
So yeah, we're just moving into this direction, uh, almost done. So an hour, like, we will share our experience as soon as we're done writing the manuals, actually. Yeah. Right, catching uh, up on, on, on some documentation. Uh, well, yeah, it's, um, it's always helpful. This documentation, well, uh, the problem is we have the code very well documented, of, like tested in various parts separately and together. The problem is that this, the documentation itself is in the code in the sense that it's in very large comments and everything. So you cannot like make a document which other people can can read without going back and forth between the browser tabs. So we have to assemble it all together in one place and make something and make it a little bit more formal. Uh, along with the obviously tooling compiler um, and way for people to be able to test it locally uh, without like too much pain installing too many independent packages, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, we have to polish it for users, even while it's done as a fundamental work. And and I ask about, you know, privacy because there's quite a bit on oh, yeah. minor extractable value that uh, uh, I think a lot of uh, industry observers see as critical to be resolved um, or at least curbed in, in a lot of ways uh, via better you know, privacy pre preserving solution. And I was reading recently about the creation of, uh, of Aztec and, and there was a big motivation there for um, security tokens in the very beginning of, of the project. Uh, which obviously require uh, a level of privacy for regulatory reasons, but even beyond, uh, if you think about um, these systems processing real-world economic activity and kind of some of the drawbacks in pseudonymity and account-based model, it is something that uh, uh, is 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 of concern. What kind? Well, levels of privacy. Maybe starting with you, Alex, and then we can switch to to the conversation on Aztec. But what levels of privacy can users of uh, zk Sync expect uh, as as this VM functionality is introduced? Uh, well, for us, uh, kind of the priority sequence was uh, first we achieve the functionality and decentralization, and then we can start to look at the direction of privacy more closely. Uh, then I would say the, like, the level of privacy is basically the same as in, is, uh, in a layer one in Ethereum, because user-defined programs are known to the, to the sequencer. So uh, whoever produces the block will know what programs he runs, and also all the state will be known. Um, eventually, we will add an ability to, for users to kind of verify their own their knowledge proofs in our system as a part of their program execution. Uh, and this will provide them the privacy that kind of you can do the same. You can verify the snark with some custom uh, logic and now in Ethereum and layer one, but it's not there yet. So for now, the priority was like, able to run end user contracts uh, with the same guarantees in Ethereum and also achieve decentralization. So it means that like uh, state replication and that um, roll up data posting to Ethereum uh, as a public data, it all should be done in, in uh, first release as a highest priority. And obviously the exit mode, whatever is it, whenever the chain stops, uh, we have a well-defined mechanism to be able not to just take out the funds, but, I, but also to kind of restart uh, the chain after some point, it, obviously in a valid state. Uh, so yeah, for us, the uh, priority is, uh, is later in, uh, in time. But I think for Ariel, it's, it's exactly opposite. Yeah, I, th I think it'd be really interesting to, to, to hear about uh, uh, Aztec's approach, Ariel, uh, in terms of, you know, first, how um, is this kind of composability achieved with Aztec, especially as it relates to DeFi applications? Uh, and then love to hear about uh, what, what do you guys think about privacy, the privacy guarantees that users can expect from using your systems uh, as 
as they launch? Uh, yeah, so uh, we uh, we sort of took a privacy first approach. Perhaps to be honest, uh, also as a differentiating factor, as uh, you know, there's so many talented, uh, smart people working on rollups. So uh, right now, if you go to uh, zk.money, you can um, get uh, just do transactions. Ethereum or DAI transactions where uh, amounts sender receiver are are totally private. Uh, and our next sort of uh, short term goal is what we call the the DeFi bridge. And that will allow you to uh, call, say, uh, Uniswap uh, in a much, first of all, in a, in a much cheaper way. Uh, because your fee will be split with all the other uh, roll-up users. And you will also get, uh, your call uh, will, will also be private. Um, so the amount you know, that you deposit uh, to say Uniswap will be public, uh, but your, your identity is, is private. Um, so basically the, the, it's a cheap, in private way to access DeFi. That's our next sort of short term goal. And we hope to have it out in the next uh, two, three months on, on mainnet. Uh, more long term, we, yeah, our aim is to uh, have what, what's called a dark, what we call dark contracts, uh, where the sender receiver and also the code of the program or logic of the transaction, they're all hidden from the, uh, the chain. Uh, and you can, you, the, pro, the logic of the transaction is totally arbitrary and user chosen. Yeah, that's, that's a fascinating uh, set, of, set of goals. Uh, and just, just out of curiosity from a data structure perspective, would it, would it be analogous to say a Zcash transaction where you have a special address type uh, like from let's let's for for the sake of comparison uh, a, a shielded to shielded transaction uh, using Zcash lingo um, so you you not see amounts you not see the sender recipient uh, pseudonyms and you have uh, essentially a blob representing the actual opcodes of of the application is that for, at a high level what that data structure would generally look like uh yeah so it's it's similar to uh if, if people know the zexy paper it's similar to what goes on there so if in in a z in zcash you have an encrypted version of your note like with the address and amount on the blockchain so for dark contracts, this encrypted note, it will contain amount, uh, well, asset type, uh, address, and it will also contain a, verific a verification key, which is what determines the logic of the transaction. Yeah, and again, and what you have on chain is just an encryption or like hiding commitment of, of this data. Really, really interesting. And, you know, one thing that I want to make sure that I ask you guys is that, um, so there's been quite a bit of, of discussions right now uh, with regards to the Ethereum virtual machine, um, you know, post the merge, uh, which is what they're calling this process whereby ETH1 is connected to ETH2 um, as one of the shards of many shards that that blockchain will support once uh, the full functionality is launched over the years there have been you know several problems uh, both in terms of usability and security with uh, the evm uh it's uh, been described as you know uh, not not uh, you know a, a great uh virtual machine and it has motivated a lot of conversations about changing it to uh, WebAssembly and and other vo virtual machines that uh, carry different sets of trade-offs. If that shift were to happen, how easy would it be 
for you guys. Is it modular enough so that uh, in case there's a change in the virtual machine that's ultimately used in Ethereum, that your systems can adapt to it? Um, is this part of the design decisions as you're building it not to be strictly married to the EVM? And this is for either of you guys. Uh, well, uh, it's obviously modular in a sense that there is some state, uh, long-term storage, and there is uh, what, like for what people take the EVM, uh, it's like a little bit extended, a state transition function. So um, the problem is at the moment when we have, have EVM as a virtual machine on Ethereum and Solidity as a de facto standard language to write the contracts for Ethereum. Uh, so we take an only the language from this list and the virtual machine for us is like completely custom designed just to be able to support everything which users want for their smart contracts. Uh, gradually starting and basically then having 99.9 .9 contracts as our goal, maybe extend the nines later on. Uh, so I would actually expect it in a different way that uh, Ethereum itself, like, if Ethereum itself will ever reconsider to uh, to change the execution environment in the sense that change the state transition function and uh, bless some other virtual machine, uh, a data model, uh, and all other related parts, maybe that Ethereum should look at the zero knowledge friendly virtual machines designed like as a part of this effort to bring. Uh, solidity to the ZK rollups, uh, then going to try to highly preserve uh, the EVM semantics or try to like follow WebAssembly, which was which was demonstrated to be not the ideal case in case if you try to keep other semantics of the EVM. For example, if your data type is uh, 256 bit large then unfortunately VASM cannot efficiently manipulate the data and it will be a huge slowdown. Uh, and the same way for gas metering, for example, as it's done now, when you pay for storage from the same gas resource as you send with the transaction, and you, then you see that your storage accesses go higher and higher and higher in, in price with potentially no limits. So maybe it should be just another resource as done by other blockchains. And there are many different parts which can be, I think, improved and borrowed from other researchers. So I really hope that this room at the end of the day will check, kind of either change the default execution environment or that one of the execution environments in East 2.0 and kind of as far as I know, it's expected to be more than one for different shards, that it will be uh, like that it will be brought much more friendly for ZK. Um, for example, or like maybe let's say just switch to standard 64 bit integer for everything other than balances and storage. And then it will also alleviate a lot of pain in different places for zero knowledge proofs too. Because like you can make faster proofs, smaller proofs, et cetera, et cetera. Fascinating. And, and how about you, Ariel? Um, what can you tell about the modularity of, of Aztec? Uh, I, I can't say I can't say much of uh, about that right right now. Uh, not in terms of confidentiality, just uh, yeah. Don't don't you're, have much you're, comment on that right now. You're, you're deeper in the weeds of uh, the low level primitives. Uh, yeah, or at the very least, I'm in different uh, uh, weeds. Uh, yeah, Absolutely. but something I sort of wanted to mention slash plug that's uh, some somewhat related and very interesting to me is I, I think we should, uh, you know, figure out syntaxes for people, especially non-SNARK experts writing circuits that make it harder to make bad mistakes. And I'll give a concrete example. Uh, you know, something you all always have in, say, a Zcash style circuit is some equation saying the uh, sum of the inputs is equal to the sum of the outputs. Uh, 
But of course, if you look inside the circuit, it's usually an equality of field elements. Uh, and if the quantities are too large that things start to wrap, you, you could get pretty bad mistakes and attacks where um, the output is actually much larger than the integer, than the input. And sort of what people usually do and what we've done at Aztec also is you sort of manually via range constraints and tracking things, you, you make sure that this, this wrap, this of uh, the modulus is not reached. Uh, so I think, so for example, I'm working right now in an abstraction where in our circuits for something like this, you won't use field elements. You'll use explicitly something called a positive integer. Uh, that is some wrapper of a field element that knows to give an error, like to say the circuit is bad, if you, uh, if you reach uh, think the, the modulus. So, so I think that also I remember from my Zcash days, there's a, there were several kinds of cases where, okay, here we really care about the bit representation, we're not thinking about it as a field element, so sort of to explicitly think what properties you're, you're looking for and then to write abstractions uh, that when people use these abstractions, it'll be very easy that the constraints you write will be what you what you mean. It'll be very hard to to make mistakes like like this, where things are not behaving as you thought they they were behaving. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's going to be critical for the not only the overall adoption of these systems, but I think the level of comfort that uh, the community has around uh, these systems. Um, it's been a fascinating conversation. Um, extremely excited to see uh, your projects uh, evolve and uh, contextualize a lot of what we discussed with um, what actual fun uh, implementations. And how can people find out more about your projects um, and uh, get more acquainted with, with your work to, to finish things off. Uh, just go to aztec.network uh, or Aztec Network on Twitter, I think. How about you, Alex? Uh, well, yeah, we have a, a website, uh, metrolabs.io, meter-labs.io. Uh, like for some general overview, uh, Twitter and Medium links for, and maybe like videos of something which I talked here or basically description of the same stuff in the, at the higher level. Uh, so yeah, it's, it should be all found there. And if someone is interested in going actually a low level, there is also a hiring button there. So we have a set of positions which we are always welcome to find new candidates. Excellent. Great. And I just want to thank you both for taking the time to share your work and your thoughts today. Uh, for anyone who wants to continue the conversation, please feel free to check out smartcontractresearch.org, where we're going to have a dedicated post to this specific panel, which will also have more information about both Ariel's and Alex's work, uh, how to get in touch, and some information on the topic of privacy and SNARKs as a whole. So we definitely want to keep the dialogue going there beyond this conference. Thanks again and enjoy the rest of the summit.